Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have the live Q&A for the ESFJ personality type. And so Jonathan, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Sure, hi Joyce, glad I could be here. Um, and everybody else, hi. Um, my name is Jonathan. Um, I live in the Portland, Oregon area. I grew up here actually. Um, lived away for a little while when I went to school and stuff. And uh, but then uh, met my met my wife in Utah. And we decided to move back because she grew up here too. So uh, I love the Pacific Northwest. Can can couldn't really think of living any place else. Um, I let's see about oh, I guess like Joyce said, I'm an ESFJ, and um, that's a, a I guess compared to my life, a relatively new discovery. I didn't really get into typology until just the last few years, and actually my wife is the one who introduced me to it. She's very much into typology a lot. And um, uh, so let's see here. I, uh, I work as a solutions architect for a technology company, um, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And I design a data storage solutions, so really all kinds of technical solutions, but I specialize in data storage solutions. And I've been doing that for the last few years. And so I'm focused on sales. I, I help the sales um, teams design solutions for our customers. And I focus on large accounts like um, Boeing, Nike, Columbia Sportswear, companies like that. And uh, But uh, that's just been the last few years. Previous to that, I worked in IT. And um, I was uh, just a, a systems engineer, did all kinds of stuff with IT systems for a lot of years. Um, worked for a local manufacturing company doing that for a long time. But uh, let's see, what else? I don't know, Joyce, what else are people interested in? <laughs> I'm not very good at talking about myself is the problem, so. Yeah, yeah. Extroverted feeling is so focused on other people that sometimes it's harder to talk solely about yourself and what you think of things. Yeah, cool. after about 30 seconds, I start wondering like, uh, does anybody even care? Because let's just talk about somebody else, right? Mm, makes sense, makes sense. And so that brings us to your first cognitive function, extroverted feeling. How do you experience that? Um, well, it's, it's interesting, right? Because first functions, because it's it's such a, a flow type of state when you're in it, it's it, I don't really pay attention to it. It just, it is what it is. And it kind of is who I am. Um, so, but since getting into typology a little bit more, I've been more cognizant, or at least tried to be more cognizant so I can understand it. And I'd say I experience it um, in that as, as I guess, a leading deciding function for me, um, it it's really just drives my values, what's important to me and helps me decide and prioritize how I spend my time, where I spend my money, um, what my plans are gonna be for the future, how do I feel about what happened in the past? And ultimately that's then gonna be driven by, am I making people happy? Am I, am I lifting people up? Am I making a difference? Um, am I making the overall group better? Sometimes that I guess happy isn't always the the end goal. Sometimes it's just a matter of better um, and bringing value to the whole group. Um, and so I, I guess that, that's kind of how I experience um, um, FE is um, yeah, just the, the the overall experience of of how I focus on other people that are around me, and that can be my team at work. It's a, a, very often my family, my wife, and my kids. Um, and then even my extended family as well, brothers and sisters and parents and stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm very active in church. And so my church um, community also comes into play there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool, Jonathan. And so other ways extroverted feeling has shown itself in him was when we were booking this live Q&A, your first response was to look to see if I was comfortable and then immediately accommodate. You're like adjusting yourself. So then the other person has the best possible experience. Um, and that was really nice of you and oh. very considerate. <laughs> cool. And so Jonathan, how do you experience your second function? As introverted sensing, SI. Um, yeah, that's a lot more cognizant, right? Um, it, the, the funny thing is, is the, um, the way that I am, my, I, I get turned around with my SI and NE quite a bit, and, and we'll talk about my NE more, I'm sure, as we go on. Um, but I think the ways that I experience it the most um, is obviously I, I, I put a lot of value on convention and the way things are done and to do things that are best for everybody and the way that things have been done is usually best. 
Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm overly traditional, but um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it is kind of my approach to things. Um, and I also, I, I mean, as a learning function, I definitely learn by experience. And with my FE driver kind of attached to that, I learn from other people's experience. I don't necessarily have to go out and SE experience something in order for me to internalize it and to learn from it. And I think my SI is what allows me then to take my experiences, even if they're the experiences I'm sharing with others, categorize those, right? And then come up with, oh, what does this mean to me? What do I learn from this? And that's, you know, ultimately how I categorize my past experience um, and, and what I learned from that. What does that really mean? Um, I internalize that and then that, that, that kind of determines what, what do I see the future as being. Um, I'm, not, I'm not super good at coming up with what the world's going to be in the future. Um, it, it, if somebody's telling me it's going to be a lot different than the way it's been in the past. Um, I, I'm open to ideas and I love to hear in this kind of my FE and my NE come into this. Um, I love to hear about other people's ideas about the future. And when they start sharing that with me, I can glom onto that and get excited about it. But I'm not necessarily going to be real good about coming up with that on my own. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, sometimes SI is, is affiliated with having a really good memory. And um, I would say that actually is not a strength of mine at all, um, at least not 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 this kind. What I am good at, though, is using my SI to build up um, tools and organizational hacks, if you will, to in order to get in order to remember and get the things done that I need to get done. I'm working in technology. That's a really big deal. There's lots of facts and information that I have to assimilate all the time. Um, and so I just come up, I use OneNote a lot and um, I organize all my information. I really enjoy actually organizing information and then, um, and then, you know, going back and going through it and then also refining it over time so that I figure out as my experience changed and as I, as I learn more things, I can refine that down and get rid of the stuff that isn't applicable anymore. But again, I kind of have to have some experience to know. And I think that's the SI piece is once I use the information, then I can start, you know, getting rid of the junk. Um, but until then, it's mostly just a collection process for me and then categorizing it in, in hopes that it will support me since I don't always necessarily remember things. I did that in school. I do that in work a lot. Um, and uh, even when I'm just planning things in my personal life, I do that a lot. Mm, makes sense, makes sense. And so how do you experience extroverted intuition, any? Well, I think for me, any really just comes about with um, being open to other ideas where SI tends to get me pretty rutted, right? This is the way that it's supposed to be and it doesn't really need to change unless there's some big driving factor. Any opens me up to the idea that things could be different than they are now. And it opens me up to other people's ideas, um, new ways of actually doing things in the physical world. Um, obviously I'm a sensor. Most of the stuff I'm talking about is in the outside world. Um, I'm just looking back at what I'm saying and it's becoming pretty obvious there, right? Um, and so I think I think that's where it is. I think my SI and any flip an awful lot um, compared to a lot of, um, you know, co-pilot SI people. I tend to be maybe a little more open to doing things differently, not stuck in doing the same. For instance, um, I love family traditions around holidays and stuff like that, gets to get get togethers. There's certain movies that are favorites and certain activities that are going to be favorites. Um, and obviously those are going to be important to me as an FE driver. Um, but I actually kind of like switching things up and doing the same thing every single year gets boring to me. Food is kind of the same way. I really like to try new foods. Um, and, and so I think that's where I experience it. And so I guess what makes, I guess that would mean that when I'm in a place of having fun and, um, and, you know, trying to connect with people and it's a little more light and not quite so serious, any comes out really, really easily. Um, I'm game to do new things and to, and to look at things in a different way. That's excellent. And so how do you experience introverted thinking, TI, your last function? Oh, geez. Well, previous to getting into typology, I thought I was a very um, uh, analytical and logical person. Um, I mean, I work in technology, right? I mean, that's I was a physics major in college before I switched to go into, and so science has actually always been 
kind of a, um, a, a favorite hobby of mine. And, and mostly because I like the process of digging into things and figuring out how they work. And TI is a lot about assimilating facts in a logical fa fashion and, and building out this linear view of things. Um, but what I figured out is um, I think that because that's so low down, it's very top of mind for me all the time. It's not a natural state. And so that's why I thought I was really good at it. Not that I'm an idiot or anything, I, I'm good at my job. But what I figured out is I use my SI to make up for my deficiencies in TI. Those are all those systems and stuff where I gather the information um, and I have to analyze that using a tool, right? Rather than having this natural thinking um, function that is analyzing those things. Um, it, you know, I, I think a lot of times that 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 function that sits behind um, the driver, that fourth function, shows up in bad ways. Um, that's usually where I see it the most, unfortunately. Um, when I get when I get emotionally overwhelmed, when I'm um, when I'm stressed out, it usually what usually shows up are really flawed logical processes in my head. For instance, the idea that. Um, you know, as a, that I'm not good enough, that, that, that I'm never going to measure up to people's expectations. And so I get these, you know, I, I put together, you know, these, the, what I think are facts, something somebody says, um, something somebody did. And I'm like, no, that, what that means is, and that's my TI putting together that logic. That means that they don't think I'm good enough or they don't think I'm smart enough. Um, um, and it, it's flawed, right? Because I'm not really using all the facts for that logic. Um, and those are the things I get upset about. That's where I'm the most insecure. I really worry about, you know, people not thinking I'm dumb, thinking I'm not competent. I'm not worried about people not thinking I'm nice. I know I'm a nice person. In fact, if somebody said I wasn't nice, I just laugh. Yeah, sure. But, but you get to this competence piece. How smart am I? Um, can I get things done? Um, you know, can I, can I fulfill people's needs? Can I put things together? Um, that's where I start getting a lot more insecure about things. And I think that's where my TI kind of shows up when, I, when I'm insecure in those things. Mm, well explained indeed. And so you'll hear words like driver and co-pilot from people who use the personality hacker school of thought. And so for context, Jonathan is the husband of the personality profiler or my personality professor at Personality Hacker. So the person who kind of teaches everyone, all the students at Personality Hacker, how to type. And so uh, thank you, Jonathan, for coming out. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And so hello, Joyce and Jonathan. Thank you for this live. What's some similarities you've been, uh, you have observed for in each other being both FJs? How does FE dominant differ from FE parent? So maybe we can approach this question by kind of viewing. So with FJs, people who share that in your code, in my, or even for yourself, how do you feel like your extroverted feeling shows up in the world in examples possibly? Hmm. Um, well, certainly you pointed out one um, in that when I get into a situation, I'm automatically shifting into how do I bring the other, how do I get the other person comfortable? How do I connect them in? Um, Effie is really a lot about connecting myself with people and connecting people together and, um, and in the physical world, right? I mean, this isn't like about, uh, you know, taking my inner self, right? And melding it with somebody else's inner self. It's about how do we connect in the world that we're in, in this conversation that we're in, in the circumstances that we're in. Um, so yeah, I, I, I get a lot of Jonathan, you're a nice guy sort of things. Um, people generally don't, I don't think talk about me in as a really deep, um, you, know, uh, you know, when they talk about me as a friend, it's more in a service and a, a more, I guess, less deep sort of a way. Um, and I think Effie kind of goes that way because it's it's really kind of just working in the moment all the time. It's not so much about what's down, down underneath. Um, yeah, all extroverted functions. So F-E, T-E, N-E, S-E, in a way work in the moment because they're dealing with the context or what's in front of them immediately at that moment, just in different ways. So extroverted feeling deals with what's in front of them in terms of emotional material. And T-E deals with things in terms of get things done in the moment and what's immediately in front of them. 
and SE is literally the most in the moment function ever. <laughs> And then there's extroverted intuition, which is dealing with the ideas that are being discussed in the moment right now. So there, that's a fun fact. Yeah. And so what are some examples of how you are a nice guy? So I agree with that. The moment I met you, I'm like, you are a very kind person. <laughs> and that was my strong impression of you. <laughs> um, I mean, really, this is another one of those where it's hard for me to talk about myself, especially if I'm going to say something nice, because it starts feeling really weird. Um, but for instance, I mean, when I when I come into a situation, I really am truly concerned about what's the well-being of the people that I'm with. Are they comfortable? And and I as, as soon as I start thinking about that, I start acting on it, which like when we sat down for this. Yeah. Take your time. Get yourself settled. Um, I. When there is a, a family get together, um, I'm really just as comfortable and prefer to be bustling around taking care of people's needs. Like I like to cook for people and make meals. Um, I like to create an environment, whether it's with decorations or making sure the house is clean. Um, I mean, even though I'm not necessarily interacting with people in all of those things, I'm taking care of people's needs so that then I know they're gonna be okay when that moment comes and we all get together. Um, and I, th there's probably some SI that comes into play and directs that too, I would imagine. Um, I think the the effy nice guy thing, a lot of it is I'm interested in, uh, I, I'm interested in people because you can't really help people bring them up and connect them unless you talk to them and you listen to what they have to say. Um, I know also as an FE driver, and for some people this can be a little bit annoying, I can smile a lot. There's a lot of extroverted energy and it tends to be positive because that's how you bring people up and connect people together. And so that that's automatically interpreted as, oh, he's being nice. Um, I don't know how to be something else. I kind of, I mean, I'm that way even when I'm not feeling nice on the inside, if <laughs> just being real. Um, so, I mean, I think that's, that's the other piece too, is as an FE driver, I'm, I'm just interested in the people in the moment and not all types are that way. So that's all automatically going to be interpreted as somebody being kind or being nice. Fascinating. And so I was wondering, how off, how well do you know your own emotions? Do you know when you're sad, happy, angry very quickly? Does someone have to tell you for you to know? What is your own emotional awareness of how you're feeling? Oh, that's, a, and that's an awesome question. If you'd asked me that 10 years ago, I would say I know my emotions very well. Um, but since figuring out how my brain works and then comparing that to my history, um, not well at all. I, it's like the last thing for me to understand. And in fact, it's, it's not uncommon and not that I get stressed out a lot in my life, but when I start um, expressing stress, um, getting snippy, getting short or impatient with people, um, uh, my, uh, my family calls it business mode when I start basically stop connecting with people and just get focused on getting things done, um, oftentimes I can become kind of terse. Almost every time that that happens, there's something negative emotionally going on inside and I'm not even aware. And it annoys me when people try to make me analyze myself. Um, mm -hmm. my, my wife's fantastic about this. Um, and she'll say, honey, how are you feeling? Are you upset about something? And usually if I am upset and I don't know I'm upset, she asks that. And it bothers me because I don't want to analyze myself. I would much, my FE is out here. It doesn't want it. Is, if you're going to make me look inside, that is way too much effort. Plus my stupid little TI in the back is, is now extrapolating. Oh, what this really means is she thinks I'm a bad person, but that's not at all. It's not what she said. Right? So together, those are, those are not a good pair. And the FE is makes me really, really out of touch with, not only how I feel in the moment, but what I want personally, because I'm so focused on what do the other people around me need and want that, um, you know, it's not even that I forget about what I want. I honestly don't know unless I actually take the time to stop and think about it. And it, and I don't like to, I don't feel like I have permission to do that. Um, my FE pretty much teaches me and has taught me through my life. And I think the society we live in does too, that other, if you are sacrificing for other people, that is the more uplifting or enlightened way to live. And, but 
a little bit of age and a little bit of experience has taught me that, yeah, the, I mean, the world would be a better place if everybody looked out for everybody else. But if you never take care of yourself, you can't look out for other people. And so, you know, as somebody who's now in his mid 40s, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what that really means and how I can really leverage that knowledge. Um, it's not natural, though. It, it, it's actually a lot of work for me to pay attention to. Well, what do I want and how much do I want it and why do I want it? Um, yeah, there's very, very foreign type of thought processes and feelings for me. Mm, yeah. So what do you want, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in all honesty, and, and some people roll their eyes at this, what I really want is for the people around me to be happy. Um, I, I really do. And, and I want people to get along and to, and to have peace with each other. I want people's needs to be taken care of. That's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of broad and existential. Um, what do I want? Um, I, you know, in, in the moment, I, I want time with my family. I want time to spend with my kids and to, and to know them so that when they grow up, um, I, you know, I haven't missed something. I want to, I want to make enough money that my family's comfortable. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to be well thought of. Um, it's not that I necessarily want to be popular, but I want to have an influence for good on people. And I want people to, when they walk away to say, I'm glad that I spent time with that person. Um, I mean, those are, those are my goals in life. Um, yeah, I guess that's really uncomfortable by the way, for me to say that. <laughs> Mm, makes a lot of sense. Um, they call it the FE emotional pivot. So when someone asks you a question about yourself, you pivot it so you don't actually talk about yourself sometimes and you direct it back to them. I know. I'm trying. Honestly, I have consciously not done that back to you because I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to help in the interview rather than just deflect. So yeah. That's another quality of FE. It's always trying to support you. So Jonathan's trying to figure out the best way to be a good interview guest. And that is very kind of you. So the way that FE parent differs. And so I think if you have an IFJ, so an ISFJ or an INFJ experiencing FE, it's a little different because one, they're more in touch with their TI, so their own personal opinion of things and their own critique of things, but it's going to be in a less burst way than in an ESFJ. Yeah. So when an ESFJ uses their TI, it sometimes comes out as either them self-criticizing themselves really strongly, thinking that other people think they're a bad person, or some other big TI leap. So when TI is used in ESFJs, it's like really strong bursts. Um, whereas like when it's used in ISFJs, it's more of a calm usage and it's less used in a weaponizing way towards yourself. And so you'll see IFJs being more in tune with their own opinions and thoughts about things. And the FE DOM will be more optimistic in general, even if they're not feeling that way, like Jonathan said, they're going to have this extreme, stronger, optimistic front than you'd see in IFJs or FE parents generally. So th those are a few differentiators. Yeah. yeah. Joyce, that, that's really true. My sister is an, is an ISFJ and that we share so many functions and we're actually, we're, 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 we're near to each other in age. And so we were really good friends growing up um, because we kind of thought the same way and we experienced things a similar way. But as you talk about the ups and downs, she's way more even keel than me mm -hmm. um, overall. And I think she knows her own mind much better than I do. Um, yeah, so that I think, yeah, your explanation there is great. Awesome. So that's another quality of an ESFJ or someone who has a stronger feeling function. They're going to say, yes, I agree, or great point, something really affirming after someone talks. Whereas when I invite on thinkers or TI DOMs, so this would be an INTP or an ISTP, they like to lead their sentences sometimes with no. And <laughs> even if they agree, sometimes they'll start it with no too, because thinking functions sometimes start off with noticing what they don't agree with or the criticisms or the illogicalness of certain things. So you'll hear it in speech patterns sometimes from some people too. 
And so Jonathan, how did you get into typology? What particular aspects personally drew you in and compelled you to invest effort into exploring it? What did you used to think about typology before? Hmm. Well, um, I'll start with the last part of the question. Um, I've always thought typology was kind of cool. Um, a, a little bit woo-woo in some ways, like it, like because sometimes it's hard to apply the concepts to the real world. And if it isn't applicable, then I haven't always found a lot of value in that. Um, and I remember the first time I took a Myers-Briggs test was in high school. It was part of like a, a class we had to take where we were planning. It was like a career planning class or something like that. So we're looking for our strengths and weaknesses. And I, I didn't test out as an ESFJ then um, because teenagers are always a little bit weird. Um, but, uh, but I remember thinking, yeah, this is kind of cool. I could, you know, it's kind of cool to be able to, because I saw it as a way to connect with other people, you know, oh, here's some other people that, that, you know, they're an I too, or they're an N too. So now we have something in common. Uh, and so that was kind of the, the first time I'd ever heard of that. And so I was pretty young. Um, but I really didn't do anything with typology for, for a long time until the last, I guess, last several years when my wife got into it. And um, as a um, as an INTJ, um, she was looking for tools to relate to other people and to make other people make sense. And um, and obviously, I would want to support her 100% in that. Um, we're very, I mean, as an INTJ and an ESFJ, we're very different than each other. And so, as she started delving into that and sharing with me the things she was learning, it became a a catalyst to communicate about what we are and who we are and what does that mean and how do we relate to each other? What does that mean for our kids? Because as we're raising our kids, any way to better understand a kid is gonna be helpful. Um, and so really I got introduced to it and I've learned most of it through her. And um, and obviously she shares stuff with me like some of your video casts and um, some stuff at Personality Hacker and other places. Um, and so I just, you know, I've gleaned that. Mostly, though, I'm interested in it because it allows me to connect with other people and relate to other people. And um, if I can understand people better, that helps as well. But really, I was kind of driven into it because my wife got into it. And anything that is going to be important to my wife better be important to me or else I'm not a supportive, helpful husband. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I came into it. Yeah, there are a lot of FE users who will adopt hobbies and interests of their the people around them because they want to foster a better connection. And so you'll see that sometimes as a general human behavior, but you're going to see a trend more with FJs because they want to find the best way to connect with you and the best way to make this relationship the best that it can be. And so as a feeler male, what aspects of your upbringing was hard for you to tackle? Did you grow up in a culture environment where you were forced to suppress your more naturally affiliative side? Hmm. Um, well, I think in society in general, yes. Um, as a feeler guy, there's it's hard not to feel like an outsider. There's other things that come into play there. But um, growing up, all my closest friends were girls. And uh, it's just because I, I liked I liked people and girls would talk about people and relationships and stuff like that. Um, you know, I could only kick a ball around so much before it got kind of boring because it's not really about people. It's about winning and winning makes people feel bad. And why would I want to make somebody feel bad? So competitive sports, which is what kind of young boys lives are all about. That wasn't really my thing. Fortunately, in my family, per se, even though my dad is not a feeler, um, there was there was an, an openness and acceptance of being different and and being a feeler and that emotions and expressing those emotions and connecting with people was an important part of life. So I, I always had a safe place to go, um, even though I didn't necessarily always fit in. Of course, by the time you know you get into high school and college, you find niches, right? People with similar interests, and there's other feeler guys out there. Um, and I realized I wasn't necessarily as weird as it seemed like when I was younger. Um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. There, there are times when you feel outside or even marginalized as a feeler male. And just like you can't relate, I still kind of get into those in those places where everybody's talking about thinker sports stuff. And I'm like, all right, let's talk about kids. My kids are my life, <laughs> you, you know, and um, but it, it's fine because one of the one of the beauties of sometimes being different is 
it, um, it, it makes me step back and just be quiet and listen. And there's, it's amazing how much you can learn about people, um, even when you're just standing on the outside. And I feel like I've been able to leverage that and um, it's be actually become a, a benefit to me. So. Excellent. That's a really great way to reframe the whole thing. And so Samuel says, I'm impressed by how well Jonathan speaks. <laughs> and hey. so, mm -hmm. Katie asks, what is your favorite way to communicate verbally versus written form, face to face or over the phone, Internet? Oh, um, well, for myself, um, face to face verbal is always going to be best. I'm, there's so much um, communication and body language. Um, so, uh, you know, I can talk on the phone and that's fine. It's just hard to read people. And I really, I, I have a hard time knowing what to say and how to react if I can't see how they're reacting. And uh, some people say, well, that's kind of fake. I mean, just be yourself, right? And react how you want to. But I, I just can't, I don't know how I feel unless I know how they feel. Um, I'm not really a written um, language sort of person. Some FE people are, not, not me. Um, I, for me, it's all, I, I learn by talking to people. I connect by talking to people. Um, so yeah, that's me. That is the most F you sentence ever. I don't know how I feel until I know how you feel. Here, right? <laughs> it, well, it's how I process feelings too. So I'm looking for other people's reactions before I decide how I feel about something. Yeah. And it, it's weird. It's, it's the opposite for your wife. <laughs> yeah, it, that's exactly right. Yeah. And yeah, and she's not always going to want to share how she feels either. And so that that always makes for interesting conversations. Mm, makes sense. And so how do you relate to ESTJs? Now I'm wondering, do you know an ESTJ in your life? Um, I've got an, yeah, I know an ESTJ. My dad's an ESTJ. Cool. Yeah. So the question is, how do you relate to ESTJs? But if it's hard to think of some examples, you can also go for anyone who has a TJ in their code too. So your wife, you could also answer from that viewpoint a little bit too. Yeah. Um, specifically ESTJs. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. and I know the type because my dad is kind of a run in the mill, down the middle type of ESTJ. Uh, you know, I love him because he's my dad. But people of his type, generally speaking, I have a really hard time connecting with because they're so busy getting things done. And I just want to, I'm like, but I want to validate you. And he's like, I don't, I don't we need to be validated. Let's go do something. Um, and so I've learned a lot from my dad uh, and, and ESTJs in general. I think by watching them, there's in some ways I can aspire to like, you get so much done in the real world and you don't get hung up on people and relationships. And there's so much less drama in your life than there is in mine. But um, it's really hard not to get my feelings hurt by ESTJs because they're just always moving forward and doing things and not always taking into account people. Um, I think there were times when I was younger, when I was pretty judgmental of people mm -hmm. like that. And that doesn't help the relationship, right? Because if I'm thinking, why are you so rude? You need to be thinking about other people. They are there, but they're thinking of taking care of them in a different way than the way I take care of them. And so as I've you know, matured and had more experience, I'm much more open to that idea. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, it can be kind of oil and water sometimes, but the biggest thing is, is they're hurting my feelings and they don't even know it. And so it's not fair for me to be offended when really, literally, the best ESTJs that I know, they they're, they're really just trying to help people and make the world a better place. So that's true. And so, what is your relationship with folks that favor abstract language? Um. Well, I mean, people are cool, and different kinds of people are cool. And, and so I can appreciate people that talk differently than me and think differently than me. Um, there, sometimes though, I just get lost. Sometimes I'm like, what in the heck are you even saying? But I, I'm perfectly happy to stand and smile and nod and even ask questions so, and validate so that I can try to catch up and figure out what they're doing. Um, you know, so, Sure, I, I'm good with that. And I can hang in there for quite a while 
with abstract language. Um, mostly, I'm just happy to be involved and to be there. And if they're sharing something that's important to them and they want me to say that and I can make them feel better about it, even if I only pick up on 50% or really understand 50% of what they're saying, I'm cool with that. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as they're happy talking about whatever that makes them happy. Yeah. <laughs> makes sense. And so how is the process of finding out about your type? Um, well, I mean, obviously my, 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 my wife who I was learning about typology through, um, I mean, she's, she's a professional profiler. And so a big part of that process was she was honing her own profiling skills on me. So I've been guinea pig and still she does that as she, as she profiles. She's like, she, cause she knows I'm an FE Dom. She'll use me to, um, you know, validate things. Um, but the, the process was interesting because I was being analyzed by the person I wanted the most approval of. And in that process, we're digging apart all the, the, the bad parts or the, the less developed, the less bad isn't right, the less developed parts of the way that I think and the way I learn and make decisions. And that can be hard <laughs> to do because you feel picked on or you feel picked apart in that process. But I think that um, because this happened at a time when I, I think that I've been in a growth mindset, then I was open to that idea. And I realized that it was, it's important to know yourself. Um, specifically, right, that, that, that TI piece that you point out, that, that's been hard and it's been hard to come to grips. I still have a hard time even understanding fully what TI is and when I'm using it and when I'm not. Um, it's, it's more like people point out things that I'm saying or doing or thinking. And I'm like, oh, that's my TI, identifying it in myself. I mean, it's bad enough to identify my feelings, let alone when I'm using, you know, a, a function that's four levels down, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the ways introverted thinking shows up is this importance on having a mind of your own separate from other people or independently made from other people. And so I'm wondering, what is your relationship with having a mind of your own? Mm -hmm. Well, Obviously, my SI tells me that that's important, <laughs> um, that it needs to happen. Um, and I've been, uh, I've been accused in my life of being uh, fake because as an FE driver, you kind of meld with the people that you're around. And my NE allows me to be agreeable um, and be open to other people's way of doing things. But the, the truth is um, that with with SI being my, my secondary function, um, my life has formed some very definite opinions I have. And just because I can be in a group and make myself meld and make them feel appreciated and understood does not mean I, I agree with them. And, um, but, you know, how do I, having my own mind, it's, it's definitely influenced. Um, more, more likely though, it influences how I act in the moment other people do, as opposed to actually changing who I am. And um, I don't feel like that my own mind inside of me has to be forced on anybody else at all. And I'm very open to changing what my mind is, but it doesn't mean that I don't have one. I feel like I'm justifying, I'm arguing, right? Um, but, and this is just the way that I see it. I feel like I do have my own mind, and but I'm just open to the idea that my mind could be wrong. And um, because historically speaking, there's so many things I didn't know when I was 16 years old that I learned by the time I was 26 and that learned more when I was 36. And so I changed my mind on those things and I'm open to be able to do that. Um, mm. So I, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. And so it's great how the process of figuring out your type was because you're married to someone who profiles people for a living. And it's kind of hilarious, yeah. Whoever marries me in the future is going to have to deal with all of the profiling questions I'm going to be asking them to see how they work in real life. <laughs> and it's probably something you have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis, being asked questions to see how you'll answer them. <laughs> there, there's your, there's your litmus, litmus test, right, for the right partners. If somebody can put up with that, then you know they're going to be a good match, right? <laughs> That's hilarious. And so what do you think about people in your life who have low FE? Do you notice it right away and how do you relate to them? Mm, yeah, I notice. Um, 
it's it's hard on me when people don't think about everybody else when they put their own wants or needs ahead of the general group um, that they think that what they what they need or want out of life is more important than what the world what the community wants um, uh, yeah I just get frustrated it feels selfish to me right and and I and, and I don't really relate to it and it those are really the low FE types are really the ones that probably may get me the most riled up um, and the most irritated. Um, I, I just, I've got a lot of openness to all kinds of types, but I just really have a hard time with people that put their own needs ahead of other people. So. Yeah, it, it looks selfish and it's hard to justify because uh, it, it's not nice to the group. Well, at least it doesn't look like it is. And so, and, and that's something that, right, I'm learning. And it's a great thing about learning about typology is you start understanding how other people's functions are working. And it's not a matter of nice or not nice. Yeah. It's, it, if it's not even on their radar or that, for instance, the, the ESTJ, you know, he's, he's just going to do it differently than I'm going to do it. And, but he's trying to make the world a better place too. But he doesn't think we all need to hold hands and sing Kumbaya to do it. Um, and so... But it doesn't mean it doesn't bug me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And so do you ever feel as though you don't have to worry about others? If not, what do you think has to happen in order for you to feel this? Oh, I asked myself that the other day. Um, I was trying to take some SI time and analyze something that had happened to me. And a lot of that comes back to how do I figure out, how do I take care of myself? And that comes down to this question is, do I ever give myself permission to not put other people's needs first? Um, I, I don't have a good answer on how to do it or when I can do it. The truth is I don't know how to is really what it is. And, and so I'm going to strive to that, not in a selfish way, but in a, in a way to be balanced in my life and, uh, you know, and just simply believing what people are telling me that if I can take care of myself, I can take care of other people better. Um, there's, yeah, I, it's, I don't think that there's anything that I could do. I don't think there's a checklist that I can check off and say, when I get to the bottom of this, everybody else will be taken care of and I can, I can focus on myself first. I just don't know that that list even exists, to tell you the truth. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. You're a lot like this YouTuber called Dr. Mike. He's like really popular, if you know about him. And he... It's interesting because I think he's an ESFJ too. Uh, some people online type him as an ENFJ. So I think sometimes ESFJs get mistyped as ENFJ because uh, people don't know how ESFJs show up sometimes. And so that's a common mistype for people to look out for. Sometimes you'll see ESFJs getting mistyped as ENFJ by other people. And so, yeah, just keep a lookout on that. And so you mentioned liking science. What other subjects do you like, not like? Um, I, I don't know that there's any I dislike. There's certainly things I'm not good at, and I don't like being bad at things per se, but I really like to learn. Like I said, my NE pops up a lot, and I, I really am very curious about things. Um, in fact, probably more than I should be. I spend probably too much time thinking about possibilities and looking at new things rather than actually using my SI and sticking to the things that are going to get the job done. Um, but I, I do love science. I, I like math. It's amazing. I'm not fantastic at it. Um, language is probably, you know, not my strength at all. Um, science and math tended to be more things. I love music. Um, I, I actually, you know, theater and music were kind of those were my hobbies uh, as, as a teenager and into college. So it was more, but again, I, 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 one of the weird things about being an ESFJ and something I've had to come to terms with myself is if I'm going to care this much about what other people need and not focus on the things that I care about the most, I can't specialize, right? There's not enough time to specialize, which means I can't spend the time it takes to get amazing at something. And though many people I believe are born with incredible talent, a lot of talent is developed because people practice and they focus on things. 
And um, because I'm, my brain is kind of wired the way that it is, I don't really allow myself to do that. So I'm more of a Swiss army knife in life as opposed to you know, having particular skills or knowledge sets that I'm really good at. Um, I'm kind of interested in everything and not really good at any one particular thing, um, except for I can be a really nice guy pretty much all the time. And so, it, yeah, right? Um, and so I just leverage that, right? And it's it's actually one of the ways that I've been, been able to be successful in, um, uh, in, in a technology field where mo most people are much more engineering type focused. There's a lot more thinkers than there are feelers in that space. Um, and so I differentiate myself, you know, develop the tools I need to make up for my mental capacity deficiencies. And then I leverage myself as being different by, you know, uh, using soft skills and connecting with people and collaborating and bringing people together. Um, but I mean, what am I interested? What are my interests and what subjects? Pretty much anything, especially if it's a way that I can, you know, I can make myself a better person or I can connect with other people in the process. Yeah, with FE dominant types, everything leads back to connecting with people better. <laughs> and you have a broken record, isn't it? Yeah. It's great. It reinforces an amazing idea. And so with extroverted intuition, it is all about knowing a little bit of everything. And so you have really strong an E there <laughs> and it's amazing. And so things that interest your wife must be interesting to you or else you're not a supportive husband. Wow, that's intense, Effie. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's actually one of those things I, I try to work on um, is that I, I probably put too much pressure right on the people around me because I rely so much on my own um, validation. It comes from them being happy, right? And them being able to do things and share things. So yeah, it, it is intense and it's not always fair to the people that are around me. And so as I get 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 older, I'm realizing that and I'm trying to to make sure that that's uh, that, that I'm not putting too much pressure on the on the people that are closest to me. Amazing. And so how does NI manifest in you? Um, and I, yeah, boy, it, it doesn't, as far as I'm concerned, it, I am probably the most deficient NI person in the world. Where is that even at in my stack? Um, is that going to be one, two, three, four, seven, seven. Like seventh? Yeah. It's, it's going to be way, way down there. Um, my brain tends to work the exact opposite way as, as NI. Um, for, for, and I distills things up to larger concepts. And for me, I'm always breaking things down into the minutia, um, which is like the opposite of my wife, right? As an INTJ. So it's actually interesting how we can complement each other when we're trying to get things done um, and, and move forward on, on projects or goals that we have. Um, because I can, I, I'm the reality check to her vision. Um, coming up with my own vision, not, I mean, I, I, I wish, like I, I aspire, I see people, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so amazing that you can look into the future and say, this is what we should become. And, and you got all these, put all these pieces together based on just a conversation that we're having. But if you want to rely on me to help you achieve that, I'm there a hundred percent. And I like that role. Mm, makes sense. Makes sense. And so do you ever overextend yourself for the sake of others' needs? Uh, service fatigue, I think is the, the term for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but fortunately, uh, that doesn't happen super often because I get so much out of taking care of other people's needs. Like it really is, I get, like right now I'm getting jazzed because I'm, I'm helping Joyce and because uh, that I might be sharing something that would help you learn. And, and so I actually get revved on that. Now, ultimately, I'm going to crash, right? Because you can only stay revved for so long. But when I when I have people over to the house and work, you know, I love to barbecue and put together a meal and even decorate and make it all look nice so they can have this really cool experience. And nothing could be more exciting and more fun for me. And I'll run myself into the ground doing that. But I'm not emotionally run down. I'm just physically run down. So as long as I take care of myself physically, um, I. It, I usually can just keep going. Um, but unfortunately, I have to be cognizant of that because I'm not always aware of how tired I am or whether the last time I ate 
um, or something like that. So. Mm, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so people are wondering why I'm dodging the screen. And that's because I have to read the questions, but they're at a really weird angle. So I have to move a little that way to see them. <laughs> so, so not, there's not some music in the background and you're like getting jiggy with it or something. Well, maybe it's both. Maybe I just like to dance. <laughs> and that's really um, commendable. Everything you do is for the sake of other people and you're quick to be of service to other people. And that's lovely. How much socializing do you need to feel energized? <laughs> um, need, man. So this gets back to, am I aware of my own needs? And when I am not, my needs are not being taken care of. I'm just so out of touch with that. It's hard to answer the question, honestly. Um, if I use, if I look back, right, if I do a little post-mortem on my life, um, enough. I mean, every day I, I need to be connecting with people. And if I'm not, I get worn down. Um, a good example. Um, I So in my previous career, when I was working in IT, I started out in tech support. And um, I actually is as much as people are negative when their PCs and, and their computers and stuff don't work, I got so much out of that because I was solving people's problems. I was making them happy at the end and I was interacting all the time. So I was either on the phone or I was in person, you know, doing, so even though I was using a computer, um, I was doing people. And as my, as my skills got honed, as my career progressed, and as I got promoted into different positions, I got further and further away from the end users in our company and much more into a high level architecting position and engineering position where I was hands down, head down, hands on the keyboard, designing things, creating documentation and configuring pieces of infrastructure. And um, I, I wasn't even aware, but I was actually getting depressed slowly. Um, and and, it, and it, it, it actually, it happened over a matter of three or four years where it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And what ended up happening was it started affecting my relationships, but I mean, I wasn't even looking at myself to know whether, what, whether, how it was affecting me. And so other people had to call out like, what is your problem? Or I had to hurt somebody's feelings and make them cry. Um, or I raise my voice and yell at somebody for me to even say, what is my problem? Like, I'm not even being me. I'm not even being nice Jonathan, right? Because that's what I, I'm, I'm supposed to have the nice sticker on. That's me. And um, it got to that point, and th the problem was, is I couldn't even figure it out. I couldn't figure out what is my, why am I not fulfilled? Why am I not happy? Why can't I get revved anymore? And um, it really wasn't until I changed my career and started working with sales teams and then, and started selling to people and meeting with people and being with people all the time rather than just working with technology. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, I found myself again. Um that I then I then I could look back on it and say, oh my gosh, I spent four years being depressed and didn't even know it, treating the people around me in in a way that I, I'm really not happy about, um, and I just didn't even know. So the answer to the question is, every day I need to have people and be making a difference in their life if I'm going to stay consistently rejuvenated and happy and have a purpose. Um, you know, I can get away with a few days or even a few weeks, but it it pays. It, it definitely has a toll on me. Yeah. Mm. Well said. And so ESFs, FJs have such a bright, vibrant face when they shine. Oh, they shine. <laughs> this is basically a compliment towards you because you're their benchmark for what an ESFJ is. So you have a bright, vibrant face that shines. <laughs> Thank you. Do you ever build up resentment about taking care of others and these folks not returning the favor or not acknowledging your kindness? Mm. Um. The acknowledgement's nice. I mean, especially with the people that are closest to me, but generally speaking with the overall population when I'm doing things for them, I don't need acknowledgement. Um, do I sometimes resent taking care of others? Um, the only time that any kind of resentment ever comes into my mind is when I have let myself become depleted. Um, because I, then I lose focus, right? I, I've lost track of why I'm doing it because it's not, I'm not being rejuvenated. So if I get too tired, um, I'm not eating right. I'm not exercising. Um, you know, this basic, you know, one, two, three of how to be a healthy person. 
Um, if, if I'm not doing that stuff, then I get run down. And once I'm run down, yeah. But then it's not just that people that I'm taking care of people and they aren't, they aren't acknowledging me. I kind of resent everything and everybody at that point in time because everybody's more selfish than I am and nobody cares. And I'm never good enough for anybody, right? The TI starts, oh, here's the logical conclusion, which is the not logical conclusion. Um, so no, I don't resent it as long as I'm taking care of myself, which again is why at this point in my life, I'm trying to learn how to do that. It seems kind of weird that a 40 something year old guy doesn't know how to take care of himself, but um, it's just an unnatural state. Mm, makes sense, makes sense. Do you feel like it's wrong to focus on yourself as a precursor to helping others? Do you see it as selfish due to not constantly helping others? I do. And I know that it's not true. Um, my wife tells me all the time it's not true. Nobody takes care of people better than her, but she's also really good at taking care of herself. And I, but I, like I said, I, I, I haven't been able to develop a checklist that I can believe that says, oh, these things are done. Now I can focus on myself. And um, so I, yeah, the answer is yes, I, I don't, I don't. There's this natural part of me that I feel like a bad person. If, um, you know, if, if, if I give every, if, if I were to feed, this is one, okay, here's an example. Um, historically speaking, I don't get to eat until I've made food for everybody else and serve them. I generally make dinner each night at our house. And what it's, it's absolutely ridiculous because oftentimes I'll miss lunch because I'm working. And so I'll go hours and hours without eating and I'll get all grouchy and start yelling at kids. Yet I'm, I'm a bad person if I don't take 10, 15 minutes to sit down, make myself a sandwich and eat it before I make dinner. And so I've had the cognitively and SI helps with this, right? Because I learn over time, but I have to take the time to get into my SI and post more to my life. And, um, but when I do that, I've now been able to come up with the logical conclusion that 15 minutes spent taking care of my physical needs is going to make the rest of the night. Okay. But sometimes I still feel like a bad person. I don't, so I just have to tell myself I'm not a bad person. And so there's, you know, these scripts I use to try to teach myself um, that I'm not a bad person because I ate a sandwich before I made lunch for my kids. Mm. It sounds like you feel really guilty for taking care of yourself. It's almost like every moment that you focus on yourself, it, you feel guilty because you're not fully focusing on other people. When you, in your mind, it's kind of telling you that you could be. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But again, I'm getting better at it. I mean, it's one of those things that once I was cognizant of it, then I'm my little baby TI is starting to learn what is the logical chain of events and how do they affect each other. Um, so yeah, I, I'm getting there. It's not as bad as it used to be. I used to I used to argue it to the death. I can't I can't go to bed right now because these things haven't been taken care of yet. Like literally, I believed that with all my heart that I literally could not go to bed because there was a whole list of things that other people needed done that hadn't been done yet. And that's just stupid. I mean, the next day is going to come. The world's not going to fall apart because I didn't do those things. And, but I might, right? Mm, makes sense. And so which cognitive function do you want to understand better? Would you like an experience? Which one would you like to experience a simulation of for a day or so? Mm. And I is one of those. I really would. Um, because I because I live with an NI Dom, try having a better understanding of how she even perceives the whole world would be amazing. SE is another one actually. Um, my brother's an SE Dom, and I it, I just think it would be amazing to be able to live the way that he does and and interact with the world the way that he does. So NI and SE are probably two that if I could somehow flip a switch and rewire my brain for a day and live like that, that would be really cool. That is so awesome. Thanks for the well-articulated answers, Jonathan. Oh. People are very charmed by how you speak. You're a very good speaker. Um, and so how do you structure your day-to-day? -day? Do you have a set routine or is it spontaneous? Um, both. Um, my day-to-day -day routine is not really dictated by me at all. Uh, I'm just because 
two things that come into play. One, I've got a family with four kids at home. And so there's demands, right? There's things that have to be done. And then my job is also very demanding and it's dictated by my customers really and, and the team that I work on. So, um, you know, I go to the meetings that I'm invited to go to and I show up when I'm supposed to. Um, but from that, um, what, I, what I do in order to be effective though, is I build structure into it. And I, I do that using tools. And this is what my SI has, has really helped me with is that, um, you know, I look at my calendar and even though it's all full of all these things that people have invited me to do and things that I have to do that other people need, and I don't really have any control over that stuff and they could change it tomorrow. What I do is I start saying, well, I know that I'm going to need time to, to plan or to design this solution or build, write some documentation, and it'll take me about a, an hour and a half. So I go to the calendar and I put in an hour and a half and I block it out. Um, if, if I know I'm going to be meeting with a customer and I have to prep with it, rather than trying to squish that in anymore, I build the structure in and say, no, oh, I need two hours to review this stuff before I go see that customer. And I find a place on the calendar and I block out that two hours. Now I'm open to changing that, but I'm building in my own structure around what's really a very dynamic um, uh, you know, lifestyle that I don't have a lot of control over. Um, but I, I can build that structure in so that I can, I can still thrive and do well. Mm hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. And when we were scheduling this call, you actually offered very quickly. It's like, hey, you know what? I will take this amount of time off for us to hold it earlier because it's near midnight for you, Joyce, and I don't want you to stay up. And I was like, that was the kindest thing anyone's ever done for me. And But I'm totally fine with f filming at midnight, too. And so I'm like, that's very nice of you, though. Most people don't notice that. And so... ESFJs are very good at the little details and making sure that you're you're being treated well within those as well. Um, and so, did you ever mistype yourself as an ENFJ? I feel like a lot of SFJs mistype themselves as NFJ because of the sensor dumb, intuitive, smart stereotype. Yeah, I I did. Um, my wife never did, but uh, yeah, I I. I because NE is such a such a, a major part in what I do every day and I enjoy it so much, so it's very top of mind for me, I thought I got to be an intuitive, right? Um, but it didn't take very long, though, to figure out that's that that's not where I'm at, right? It's Or that it's further down. I am an intuitive, right? I mean, there's still NE there, but my SI is definitely higher on the stack. Makes sense, yeah. Another reason for why this happens is tests are biased towards the INFJ dichotomy, at least the free ones. And so I've had ENFJs even, I mean, sorry, ESFJs even score INFJ on tests before too. That happens a lot. A lot of ESFJs actually think they're INFJs and I have no idea how to. Uh, That's crazy, right? What's funny is when I took the Myers-Briggs test in high school, that's what I ended up as. And then I had to give a presentation on how I was an INFJ. And that it's that's it's a little bit nutty. I mean, the, the INFJs that I know, I can relate to lots of things there. Um, but yeah, it definitely is not me. Yeah, it's a very common thing. A lot of the INFJs are also ESFJs as well. Just putting that out there. And so what is your view of the future or the and the past? Hmm. Um, that is a very open question. So I'll try to interpret it as best um, for what you're going for. Um, for the, the future for me, as I view it, um, really what I'm looking at is how am I going to take care of the needs of other people in the future? <laughs> is, is That's the way I look at it. And it's very open to me. Um, what it's going to be isn't distilled down or solidified. Um, and, and I'm open to that. I'm okay with that, actually, because I feel um, I feel confident that wherever it's going to take me, I'll be able to roll with that. Um, not, not everybody is, is unanxious about the future, as I would be. Um, the past is not something that can be changed, but it definitely dictates what the future is going to be. And um, ultimately, the past is what I've become. So when I look at the past, the, if actually if, if I were to you know open myself up and look inside and say who's Jonathan, 
what I would really see is in this aggregate of all these experiences that I've had. And, um, you know, and that's, that's how we become something is from our past. And, you know, that's what I, that's what I learned from. That's how I find context for things. I, I probably should, um, and especially for somebody who has SI as high in the stack as I do, I should probably spend more time analyzing my own past and what I've learned. My NE, I think, likes to hop up um, in, in the stack a little bit. They, they, they get twisted, I guess is the best way to put it. And, um, and so personally, I don't, uh, and that isn't true for all ESFJs. Um, but um, when I do take the time uh, to, to analyze the past, there's a lot of fulfillment in that and a lot I can learn. For me, that's where the, that's where the epiphanies come. That's where the realizations come. Um, I also love to reminisce. So that's the other piece too, is I like to actually spend, just spend time in the past with other people. And um, I find it's, it's a really great way to connect with people and to learn about myself and them is by talking about their past or past experiences we've had together. Mm. I have a question. So let's say there's this TV show that nobody you're connected to is watching. So it's just not, would you ever watch TV shows that no one else is into? Just like, just because you like it? Uh, yeah, and I do. I, I really like like sci-fi sci-fi shows, and I like I like the weird ones, not even the mainstream ones. I like to try them out and see because I'm really interested in different ways that mm. producers and directors come up with you know a, a whole different idea of a different universe that could exist or something. And again, that's my it's my play state with my NE. Like when I when I want to relax and have a good time, my, my NE really comes out, and so I'm open to that. And I, I don't necessarily, if I'm going to watch a show, um, I, I I prefer to watch it with somebody, but mostly I prefer to watch funny shows or romantic shows with people, the shows that are going to bring out external emotions so that I can connect with the people that I'm there and we can talk about it and we can laugh about it and we have inside jokes. But I I can enjoy just sitting down, like I said, and, and watching, you know, an, an episode of Firefly. Um, and when nobody else I know or, or talk to watches it or even cares who Malcolm Reynolds is, like it, that's that's okay with me because I kind of like getting into a mode sometimes um, where and I lose myself in those in those moments to do that and and that's fun. It's it's re, it can be really relaxing for me to do that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and so Jonathan mentions how his function NE can be very strong. So half of ESFJs are more on the FESI side and the other half of ESFJs are more on the FENE side because the middle two functions, they vary in strength. They're pretty much relatively the same strength for some people. And so you'll notice a bit of that in the people that you type to if, if people in the audience members type people that they know. So personal thoughts on Young's individuation process. Are you in pursuit of it personally? So what Young's individuation process is, is it's the process of becoming your own individual apart from other people. So creating your own sense of self that is different than what's around you, almost becoming your own individual. Uh, what is your experience of that? Um, I, it's important. It's not, I mean, as I've talked about all along, uh, you know, I, I think that the group is more important than the individual overall. Uh, it's just the way that I see the world. But that being said, and I'll use this as, as an example, um, I'm, my, my religious faith is a very important part of my life. And um, one of the key tenets there is that I have to develop my own faith. I can't just have faith because my family had faith or my friends have faith. Um, but that I need to have a relationship with God by myself. And so that in and of itself has driven me um, and, a and a wedge, if you will, has made me say, no, I, I need to separate myself. And there's a lot of fulfillment. And what I found is there's a lot of power and there's a lot of confidence that can come through indiv individualization that way. When I can say I don't need to and shouldn't rely on other people in order to have worth and in order to have strength and to be who I am. Um, and so I guess what I found is by, by finding out who I am and what is important to me, and in this case, it happens to be around faith. 
I'm actually more able, I think, to help other people and connect to other people. Um, because if I am, if I am so codependent and needy on the feedback that I, I mean, that I can't even be a person or I can't be strong without always getting strokes from, you know, the, the, the tribe and the group and the society that's around me, I'm not going to be strong enough to hold people up when other people fall. And that's what I ultimately want to do. Right. I mean, that was one of my goals is to lift people up and to make people better. So yeah, I, I absolutely believe that that's something that we need to focus on, even though it's uncomfortable. Um, and I think there's a ton of strength in finding who you are individually and then strengthening that, right? Really separating yourself. Mm, well put. And so do you choose your social environments? Do you avoid toxic environments and negative people? How do you stay positive if the people are not giving you the validation you need? Oh, that's a cool question. Um, yeah, I mean, I do choose social environments. What I find though is I have an awful lot of uh, um, ability to influence whatever environment I'm in. And uh, so I kind of take my good social, my good social environment with me. Um, and I make it pretty clear what my expectations are when I'm around people. I don't put up with a lot of negativity, but what I found is like in toxic places, some people are just negative. All they, all, it seems like all they can say is something negative. All they can do is rip on other people or blame other people for their problems. But it's amazing how listening to those people and expressing empathy and asking questions about why they feel the way they feel, um, it's amazing how much of that negativity and toxicity can be vented out of that relationship and out of that connection to make it much more bearable. But ultimately, yeah, I mean, I'm an optimistic person. And if, if people can't, aren't comfortable being around me, being optimistic, it, it just very naturally, we, we don't end up in the same room. We don't end up in the same circles. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I feel like I can kind of carry that optimism and that positivity with me pretty much in, in most cases. Yeah, and that goes back to our previous questions. Jonathan said the line, I influence my environment, which is a sign of being an FE dom if he were an FE ox type, so an ISFJ or an INFJ, they would probably not say that. So if you're FE ox, you're more about acquiescing to your environment. If you're an FE dom, you're more about influencing your environment. So that's one of the differences. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I was um, I was talking to my wife about defining how FE users influence people around them. And she used the term manipulate is what she did. And, and I'm like, nah, -uh, cause there's a, there's such a negative connotation with the idea of manipulating people or changing people when it isn't necessarily their choice or their will. And especially in our society, right? In Western society, I think that's especially true, right? Because our own ability to choose and control ourselves is so important. And so I really struggled with this idea that my FE was manipulating other people's emotions and other people's feelings. But when, when you really break it down, and I'm just trying to be objective about it, it's exactly what I do. Um, I go into a situation, and I am literally trying to change the way people feel so that they can connect with each other, so that they don't feel marginalized, and so that everybody can be more optimistic and, and, and happy and walk away. And if, I mean, in this case, it just means this is a, it's a good manipula manipulation, right? If, if, even though there's maybe a, a bad stigma associated with that word. Yeah, it's almost like you're manipulating people's emotions to make them want to do the thing. It's yeah. kind of getting them to embrace whatever they're doing, getting them fully into it. So it's almost getting their, them emotionally on board. And that's the best way to get people to buy into anything. And so they actually feel happy doing the thing as opposed to feeling resentful. So you're great at that. You're great at making people feel good about what they're doing and about themselves. So that's a superpower. What is the big difference between the ENFJ and the ESFJ in your opinion? How do you know you're not an ENFJ? Um, so I think that, I mean, I'm just thinking about the ENFJ. I've got a, a close friend that I've known for a lot of years that's an ENFJ. She's, she's a great gal. And um, as I think about her compared to me, there are a lot of similarities for sure. And we get along super well. 
and we're motivated by the same stuff, right? Um, I mean, she's just like me. She spends her life thinking about other people. Um, she's she's a lot more strategic though in how she goes about it. I tend to um, focus on this moment. She's a lot more forward thinking. She's a lot more thinking about what's going to lead to what and what is that going to mean. Um, I, I think as a whole, she's um, I've seen her in positions where she has um, she's been in charge of, of people and things and she's better at it than I would be. I, I can step in and taking charge and making people feel good and making people want to follow me is not difficult. But as far as actually um, coming up with a vision, right, of this is what we're going to do and this is why and this is why it's important. I mean, she's so natural at that compared to me. And so I would see that's that's a big thing. It's, it's about vision and being able to instigate an overall strategy as opposed to simply reacting in the moment. Um, I don't know. Joyce, what do you, I mean, what do you think? That, that's kind of how I see a difference. That's a beautiful way of describing it. And so you'll see the theme of local versus global. And ESFJ is going to have more of a local scope. So they're a little bit more reactive in the moment, whereas an ENFJ is going to have more of a global scope. So they're going to be more about that strategic long-term vision and having that long kind of longer term abstract aim for something too. What you mentioned too, Jonathan, were some interaction style things too from Linda Behrens. So the ENFJ is actually in charge. So they would have what exactly Jonathan said, this ability to scope a vision and to be in charge more than an ESFJ would be. An ESFJ's interaction style is get things going. And so they're going to be a little more get everyone to, to want to and get people's feelings up in, in practical ways and in other ways. But they're not trying to chart everyone on, in, a, in a singular direction in a more intentional way as the ENFJ is, is doing regularly. So that was a really good differentiation. You, you hit the nail on the head, Jonathan. And so I'd really like to understand how inferior TI manifests for the ESFJ. And so we talked a little bit about this, but I was wondering if I could ask questions to dig a little more. I was wondering, <laughs> how often does your inferior TI poke out? Once a month, once in a blue moon? Uh, um, in the negative way, is, is, is that what you're asking? In both ways, positive and negative. See, <laughs> I, to answer that question, I have to be more self-aware than I am. And I mean, because I don't pay attention to myself. That's so what you to say too. I don't all, pay attention to myself. This is your yeah. tagline in the interview. <laughs> um, so I guess in hindsight, there are, there are definitely periods of time in my life where negative TI, meaning the... the the, the what I what I assume are logical conclusions in life about things that are really not they're based on fallacies and my negativity right that I have inside but there are certainly like for instance I talked about those few years where really I, I was low-grade depression for like the whole time because I wasn't being fulfilled my I mean that that super inferior ti was I mean it was showing up all the time because I was always jumping to conclusions about what people thought of me and what my relationship was with people. Um, and, but my logic was completely flawed, right, in how I put that together. And that, I mean, that that honestly could have been on a daily basis where that was showing up and it was affecting what I did and the decisions I made. Um, I would say, I mean, there's other periods of time more recently where I've been much more mentally healthy. So that negative side or the flawed logic didn't, doesn't really manifest itself very often at all. So maybe once a month or something like that. And it's usually because I got really tired or something. Um, mm. I think though, I mean, that TI is with me all the time and it, it shows up the most or it's blaring when it becomes negative, um, especially because it really disrupts my FE right and also be, because it's a hurting other people a lot of times is, is the way that that comes out so but i mean the concept of relying on um uh, logic the world is logical the world needs to be explained logically and and whatnot I, I rely on that every single day of my life 
And um, even though I'm not fast at it, um, I leverage it um, on a regular basis. I mean, I, I work in technology. I have to design scientific solutions that work at the end. And so I have to take these concepts and these facts and put them together in a way that's going to come up with something that's going to work the same. And my SI helps a lot because I can fail and learn from that. And now I have a template to work from. But my NE is always making me try new ways of solving stuff. And so I have to use my TI, right, in order to put that stuff together. And so and, and so in some ways, it, 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 I, I've used it as a strategy. I make money on doing that. So it's not so inferior, right? It's not like it's like sixth, seventh, or eighth down in my stack. It still shows up. I still logic is still a regular part of my paradigm on life and putting facts together in that logical way and coming to a conclusion. Um, and so, like I said, it's it's kind of hard to say how does it manifest. Well, I, I don't know what it would like be like not to have TI be part of my my paradigm in the way I define the world that I'm in. Absolutely. I have a question for you, Jonathan. How comfortable are you when people are debating or when you're in a debate? Mm. Not, not. And for two reasons. One, because debates can turn ugly really fast. And that's the antithesis of even talking with people is for people to get upset and mad. Um, the other piece too is uh, putting, putting together the facts and the things that people are sharing and then sharing a logical conclusion is not my strength. And I'm always worried about not only looking dumb, but coming up with the wrong conclusion. Um, because especially when it comes to, to, to people, social issues, things that I'm not well, well educated in. Um, I mean, I can, I can argue things I know. I mean, if, if you wanna talk IT solutions, if you wanna talk about my kids, um, if you want to talk about my faith, things that I've spent a lot of time studying in my life, I can argue those if you if you want to call it that, or I can debate them or share an oppositional point of view and be very confident in that and not have it not get ugly because I can because I'm confident, I can be objective. I can feel comfortable in that. Um, but mostly I, I stand back and I listen. Um, and my way of debating is not making a point, but asking more questions because I don't have the conclusion, but I do, as people talk, I do come up with, but what if, but what about, but you know, this has happened in the past. How does that apply with what you're saying? And so that's usually my approach in those situations. I generally don't like to take a stand. The other piece too, is I also know I'm wrong a lot. I think people in general are long, wrong way more than they think they are. And so I, I kind of hold on to that. So it doesn't do a whole lot of good to dig in unless this is something you know for sure that you know. Otherwise, you should probably keep it open. Mm, that's a good stance to have on things. And so what is your love language? Do you prefer to express care for others? And how do you like to receive care? Um, uh, words of validation, right, are, are obviously going to be important to me. I do like to be appreciated, especially with those people that are closest to me. Um, because it needs to be sincere, right? When we're talking about love languages, just words in general, when they're um, a script, don't mean as much. So words of affirmation is big. And then um, physical touch. I mean, it, it's just another way for me. It's another way of connecting with people and holding hands and hugs and even just poking people or, you know, a hand on the shoulder. Those sort of things um, are very, uh, they're a very rejuvenating, uplifting. They make me feel appreciated. Makes sense. I find that love languages is also tied to sexual orientation too, or gender. Um, I find that men tend to list physical touch higher in general. I mean, women can like it too, but if you survey a bunch of people, men, for, they're more physical as a whole. So that's pretty interesting. Hmm. And so how do you express care for others? I know you mentioned you cook for people. Um, yeah. What are some other ways too, if you can think of more? It's okay if you can't too. Oh, no, I can't. I mean, I just rewind any given day. <laughs> um, and because I try not to let any any moment pass without it being toward that end. Um, words, I, I, I think words are important. And I, I don't think you can say I love you too few times. And people might say it cheapens it, but I don't think it does. So anytime I get off a phone call with a family member or a close friend, 
I say thank you or I appreciate you or I love you. I say I love you to my kids probably 50 times a day. And they probably hate it. Uh, they probably, especially since like we'll argue about something and I'll send them to their room and I say, I love you as they're walking away, but I'm serious. And so I think words make a difference. And I think people need to be reminded by that. So that's one way I do it. Obviously service. I mean, taking care of people's physical needs is a way of showing that you care. Um, you know, give, basically giving up my own time and my own energy. That's how you show you care. Um, I think that um, uh, affection is another way of showing people you care. Um, giving somebody a hug or a rub on the back or a squeeze on the arm, those sort of things. You, you can, I, I think that there's a lot that can be communicated that way, but you have to read people. Um, not everybody, not everybody are the words the right thing to do. My kids get it whether they want it or not, but not everybody is that. Sometimes words of appreciation are the way to do it. Sometimes the squeeze is the way to do it. Um, other times it's, um, uh, you know, acts of service. So yeah, I, I think, I think honestly, I try to just read people for what they are and I try to show my care and affection according to what their love language is or what's going to make a difference for them. Um, I like to cheerlead a lot too. That's another way that, that I show that I care. And I know that's kind of words of affirmation, but, but I try to be really real about it because, um, I don't know, words can be so fake. And when you tell people, you did a great job, right? I mean, you can hear that over and over, but if I can be specific and if I will also be honest with them when they don't do a great job it is in the most kind way that I can, then they can believe me when I tell them how good they did and why they did good and and why they're better than these other people or or how they how they made it, they, they grew since the last time we talked. People that I work with, I really try to focus on those sort of things. And it's amazing how much trust you can build by being honest in a caring way. Um, yeah. That's a beautiful lesson. And so something learned here is that feelers are more likely to say, I love you. And so I know that sounds weird, but like feelers will very freely, some of them, like a very small section, but people who do this very, very easily tend to be feeling, feeling types. So if they tend to say to their friends or their family members, such as someone, I love you very freely, it's a it's an indicator that it's more likely that they're a feeler. I mean, a thinker, a thinking type can do it too. They're less likely to be so free flowing with the word I love you or emotional affection in yeah. that sorts. Yeah. Well, and, and I've I've had that experience with um with thinkers and also people that um are more FI than FE. Mm -hmm. um, their feelings are so personal to them. And so sometimes verbalizing those things either feels like it puts it, it you have the chance of putting things in, a, in, a, in an unsafe place or it cheapens them, or it's just nobody else's business what my feelings are. And, and so that it's interesting though, because I'm so not that way. I am, um, I, I, it's, it's typology has opened my mind to how, how actually wonderful and sweet that is. Um, and how I can appreciate where they're coming from, that they aren't just closed and they don't care. Um, but it's such a personal thing to them that, you know, it's, it almost hurts sometimes to say it out loud or to share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The more vulnerable and true a feeling is, the more FI wants to, is almost afraid or afraid or wants to keep it safe inside itself because it's afraid right. of butchering it if it puts it into the world Yeah, or other things too. My ESFJ buddy is dating and gives some jerks way too many chances. She is so optimistic and cheerful. She doesn't see someone is manipulating her. What advice can I give her to be more cautious? Oh, oh, geez. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, I've been accused of being naive many times in my life when it comes to people who are overly optimistic or giving people too many tries, just like your, your, your friend. And um, I think the biggest, well, you have to gauge it. So here's, here's, here's part of it is just because you are looking at the situation and you see your friend as being abused. And I'm assuming this isn't like physical abuse, like somebody should be reported to the police type of things or emotional abuse that way. Um, but it, it, what might look like that 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 your your friend is being used, but is your friend fulfilled and happy and at peace with what they're? And if they're not, 
then that's different. In that case, then it's, it's, I think the advice you can give is you are worth so much more than what this person is giving you. That's the advice you can give. And you, you, you're going to have to give concrete reasons. Their, 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 their TI is not going to put the logic together very well. And so you're going to have to be very specific about how they aren't getting what they deserve out of that relationship because they aren't always going to see it, especially if, you know, it's, it's, ESFJs like codependent people. We, we like to be relied on. It's where we find our value. And, and yeah, it can really blind us to people that don't treat us well. Um, and I've certainly had friends that have basically eaten up my time and my energy to no end. But it's because I, I, I didn't see it, first of all. But then also I needed to be told that I was important enough and that I had permission to, to not have those people treat or that, that there was somebody that there are other people out there that could and would treat me better than that. Right. And, and that I could get the same fulfillment out of that. So yeah, I think be specific about where the problems lie and make sure that they understand that they're worth it. Um, mm, yeah. And so one of the ways that an ESFJ's low or bad TI shows up is in naivete sometimes. It does. It really does. Mm. I've heard ESFJ males choose the career as firefighter often because of their giving personality traits. Did you ever think about becoming a firefighter when you were young? A firefighter? Um, probably not seriously. Um, and the main reason um, is, well, there's, there's two. One, when I see other people in pain, it's really hard on me. Um, the other one is I've never been... Um, I've never been a physically strong or athletic person, especially growing up. I wasn't right because my interests lied other places. So I didn't develop those skills in myself. I'm much more athletic as an adult than I ever was as a kid. And so the idea of doing something that physical actually kind of scared me. I'm like, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't be strong enough. I wouldn't, but certainly caring about people. Um, it's the same thing as like becoming a doctor. Like, would you want to become a doctor because you care what you want to help people like, but then you have to see people hurt. Plus I'm not smart enough. That's always the answer, right? Because when you never take time to specialize and find your talents, it's really easy to lower your expectations of yourself. Yeah. Something I notice you say a lot is, but I'm not smart enough. And with my ESFJs that I invite on to, they'll also say that a same exact thing They're there, but they're, I always find that they underestimate themselves. I'm like, everything you said was perfect and beautiful and amazing. It's like A plus. But I find that being a high feeling type, you can have insecurities about how logical you are. You might be perfectly logical and amazing, but you might have but you'll have that insecurity about your logic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I think about where people are going as opposed to where they could be, I get irritated. How do you feel about this? i.e. people in the country dividing rather than coming together. I hate it. No. It makes me it makes me sad. <laughs> I yeah, totally. I, it like I, I literally it's like can't we all just get along? I mean, like nobody in the world wants people to be poor. Nobody in the world wants people to get shot in the head. Nobody. I mean, everybody wants this their families to be happy and to have friends and to feel loved. So it's like, why, why are we separating? Like we can't solve the problem separate. We can only solve the problem together. And it, like, if I were to read a transcript of what I'd say, I'd say, man, you are so frou-frou dude. Like, I know what I'm saying doesn't really solve the problem, but yes, I, I, it just kills me inside when I see how people treat each other and how people oppose each other. Um, it's like, even if you don't believe the same things or have different points of view or had just plain just different facts and experience, I just don't understand why as people, we, we have to be so as separate as we are. I, I, I really, I struggle with that. Mm, me too. We'd love to know, as a feeler man with a thinker wife, do you find it affects roles in your marriage? Hi, Paul. Uh, sure, it does. Because there's different things that we want to do and feel comfortable doing. I mentioned that most nights I make dinner for the family. I I mean, I don't know. Traditionally, it seems like that's kind of a mom thing. In our family, that's not the way that it is. Um, I mean, my, my wife is an amazing mom. I mean, nobody could be more dedicated to taking care of her kids. But when it comes to like doing the, the sensor jobs around the house 
and that type of minutia as an INTJ, that stuff drives her nuts. And I kind of like get in a flow state and kind of like doing it and get fulfilled when it's all done. So if you're looking at maybe what would be traditional roles with men and women, yeah, I think it flips things around a little bit. Um, I've had people point at our relationship and say, in fact, I've had people make fun of me and say, well, I know who wears the pants in that family. And I'm like, you got no idea what you're talking about. My wife is strong and she is smart, way smarter than me. If I'm not listening to what she has to say, I'm an idiot. So, I mean, the way that I see that stuff is like, I guess I don't know where different, where, what people believe about what traditional roles are, but um, there's it because of the way that we are. And because also we're just so different than each other. It's not just that it's not traditional, but we really rely on each other to fill in the gaps wherever that is. Um, and it's, it's, it's more of a survival tactic more than anything, not with each other, but just, I mean, we've got four kids and, um, some of them, you know, have have some real struggles in their life. And so it takes a lot of dedication from both of us and time and energy in order to help them with those things and support each other. We can't be worried about who gets to scrub the toilet or who's making the pancakes for breakfast. We need to be worried about much more important things than that. And so we fill in, we fill in the gaps where we can fill in the gaps. I mean, that's the way we work. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of your answers to all of the questions are very positive. <laughs> And yeah, with feeler men, with thinker women, you'll always find the divide where the women will have some of the traditional masculine qualities that you would expect. Maybe the males would have more of sometimes. Um, and the the guys tend to have a little bit more like feminine associated qualities like cooking is something that Jonathan mentioned. This will vary depending on the person, but it's a story I hear over and over again. That's one of the cues that there's this dynamic in a relationship. Yeah, I like to do crafts too. <laughs> <laughs> and so what is the potential point of friction with other people as a result of your particular functions? Um, points of friction. Um, you, I mean, people that, that People that show that that come off as selfish, that's going to be a point of friction. Um, uh, people that people that are unwilling to connect, sometimes that can be a point of friction because it's like I don't, I don't know what to do with myself if you won't let me connect with you. Um, uh, friction is probably not the right word because honestly, the whole the whole point of FE, my whole paradigm is no friction right? Things need to move easily. People need to be connected to each other and, and, and flowing and everybody needs to be comfortable. So, um, on the inside, sometimes, yeah, I'm, um, if, if, the, if we re, I guess if we reframe that and say, where does discomfort show up? Um, that's, that's where those discomfort shows up. People that, you know, people that are basically themselves over other people and, um, and also people that are just so separated, they won't, they won't allow us to connect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are you in school in a social social setting of a class? Um, I used to. I I enjoy so going to class and being there just because the group is there. Um, learning in a group is fun for me. I often have. Um, been told by professors, stop raising your hand, stop asking so many questions, or stop talking, Jonathan, <laughs> um, because the, the banter in a, in a in a in a situation like that in a is that's like the best way to learn for me, and I, I and I get kind of you know I get ramped up right as I start. I ask the question, they answer it. I get validation. Somebody behind me says, "Oh yeah," and they answer, ask a question that's related. And I'm like, "Oh, I just started something," and and so yeah, I love that. And then um, you know, and then there's the social piece of that too, right? Which is the validation of the other people that are in the group. How do you make the other people feel smart and learn as well? I love teaching, by the way, and I and I do that professionally. I do technical training classes on a regular basis. And it's one of my favorite parts of my job is to actually 
to have an educational situation with a group of people and to facilitate that process. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, I, I come out of those days and it would be like if I took the best drug in the whole world, right? That would never have any bad consequences uh, when I come out of those situations. Mm, what is your facilitation style, Jonathan? Um, ask that again, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, how do you facilitate? So oh. what is your method? <laughs> um, my method is, my method is ask lots of questions and follow-up questions. Um, and that's that's not necessarily going to be the case with every FE Dom that I've that I've met. But for me, if I can ask the question and then um, and try to keep it as open-ended as possible so that it's a conversation, because what I'm really facilitating is a volley of ideas. Um, even if I know the answer, if I can ask them about it and have them fill it in, I give the validation, I add some more color around the outside, present some more material, ask the question, get and, and, and do that, and not and make sure that it's not just one person too. So the facilitation is that, um, in fact, sometimes if I know that somebody else in the group can answer the question for the person who asked the question, I'll just, I'll pitch it to the other student and give them a chance to sign, to shine and to connect and to make a difference. Um, yeah, that's how I facilitate. That's amazing. And so as a natural people person, what kind of socialization tactics were natural for you growing up that you'd observe not everyone is capable of? Socialization tactics, huh? Um, well, I mean, if, if it's a tactic, uh, don't be disagreeable. And I think that's the best way. It's not just a matter of being nice. It's don't be oppositional. It's, it's in the situation, read who you're with, and what they what they want or what they like, even if it's dumb, um, and 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 blend, be there, um, and it's it's amazing like what kind of a difference that and you you can do that. And I think that really is a tactic. It's allowing yourself to blend. Um, some people might say that's fake. I don't think it's fake because I'm literally trying to do what I naturally and um, want to be and do, which is you know, to, to, to make a difference there. Um, I think other social socialization tactics um, is identifying the marginalized and the, the people that are on the outside. Um, and it's, it's can be pretty amazing when you identify the, an individual in a social situation and you can either bring them in or you move yourself and then other people migrate over. Um, and, and so, there's, there's a tactic there for inclusivity. Um, and uh, yeah, it, growing up as a, as a kid, that was one of my best, it seemed like I was always becoming best friends with the underdog in the class. Um, but it's not like I didn't have other friends. I mean, I, I, could, I could pretty much go to any group, um, any clique in high school, any club. Um, and there were people there that I knew and that I liked and that liked me and I could spend time with them. And I was cool with that. And they were cool with having me there. Um, I mean, it's not that I never got picked on, or I mean, there's always going to be jerks in the world, right? But yeah, so those are. I mean, those are the those are the tactics I came up with. Is allow yourself to be at least to, to show up as part of what they are. You don't always have to be separate and oppositional to things, even if you do have a different idea than them. And the other one is inclusivity. It's like f identify the people, the outliers, and um, that makes a, just makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering, Jonathan, if you went to a wedding and they had a certain way everyone was going to dress, let's say stripes, would you ever go to that wedding and totally go against the dress code and wear a like bright red, let's say, for example, and no one else is wearing it? And why? The answer to that question is maybe um, because there there is kind of a part of me that that likes to stand out if it can make other people happy. So, and, and so, because th th there's an entertainment factor associated with interacting with people in social situations. And sometimes making yourself look like the standout or the goof puts other people at ease. Sometimes um, it's, some people are just too serious 
And so you, you can liven things up. A big part of that is going to be what, and this is where SI comes into play, what is socially appropriate? In some places, a wedding, for instance, the likelihood of me doing that's pretty low. Why? Because the focus of that day needs to be on those two wonderful people that are getting married. And if I'm distracting from that, that's not cool at all. My SI says that and my FE says that all day long. Um, so no, probably not likely. But if I knew, if let's say I'm best friends with the groom, and I knew that his sensibilities and his sense of humor would absolutely love it, I would, ab I would make an idiot out of myself and embarrass myself if that would really make a difference to him. Absolutely, I would do that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like depending on you'll do something if it can make someone happy like so it depends on if it can make someone happy yeah i wouldn't show up in the red suit simply because i like the red suit and i thought stripes were dumb i would never do that, that mm, yeah makes sense and so how do you interact with strangers do you treat people the way you would like to be treated and once you build the relationship you begin to develop a custom framework for the relationship question mark hmm um, multi-part question. Custom framework. Yes, about the custom frameworks. Um, as much as FE is about the group, the group is made of individuals for me. And so there is definitely a custom framework associated with individuals. Um, and my SI really helps me with that. Um, because I, I'm not good at intuiting things in the future. So I build a profile of what, what people need and what not out of my past experience with them and other people that are like them. And I, I just try to read that as best as I can. Um, I'm fine interacting with strangers. I mean, as, as outgoing and people person as I am, there's actually a lot of anxiety on my part going into a situation and being around people that I don't know. For instance, before I came on this call, I got really sick to my stomach before I sat down because I was anxious that I was gonna do something that would be disruptive or dumb. And because I don't, I, I can't see any of you. I, I, I've only talked with Joyce a couple times before, right? And so I just, my, my SI had nothing to hold on to. And so there's a lot of anxiety there. Um, so I, I have to rev myself up for new situations. If the situation isn't new and it's just the people that are new, like I go to church and a new family is, is, comes into my congregation uh, I got no problem walking up to that person because this is a situation I know. It's just, I know what's appropriate. I know what's not appropriate. I know why they're here, generally speaking. And so I can offer that. I, I can get support and I can facilitate, be a catalyst for them to do better. So it isn't that they're strangers in and of themselves, but strange or different circumstances, th that can be really, really hard on me. And it can really throw my FE off. I mean, I, I just it's hard to get on my game in those situations when I don't have an anchor of, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate right now. Mm, yeah, so SI feels more comfortable when it has precedence. So it has an anchor to base this off of or a template or something to base the current situation off of. If it's completely, utterly new, that is anxious inducing to SI. And that was well explained, Jonathan. Do you find some sort of relationship between your type and your faith? Do you think it influences how you relate to other theists, atheists, God, etc.? Oh, it, it, it has to. I don't know how it couldn't. Um, I mean, but I mean, if we look at my wife is in the same faith and very strong in it, and she's very different than me, but she experiences it differently than I do. Um, and so I understand that. But yeah, I think absolutely. The, um, I think each of us, finds what is our philosophy on life, what is our faith, however you want to define that, based upon the way that we learn and the way we define our values in our life. And we learn and define our values based upon the functions that our brain is designed with. Um, and so for me, absolutely, I mean, my, my faith has grown. And I'll use this as an example. So one of the ways that I knew that my faith was important to me was I went to some youth camps as a teenager and they were focused on building faith, you know, learning about God. And, but that whole process was a whole bunch of teenagers getting together, right? And sharing it with each other and doing service projects together and, um, and doing social things all together. And so 
absolutely did that foster a faster faith growth experience for me than it would be, say, for my wife. Yeah, absolutely. I, I loved going to youth conferences as a teenager because finding like-minded people and other people that had faith like mine, that built my faith. Um, that isn't true for everybody else. And I, and I recognize that that's, in fact, some people would say exact opposite. They need to find their faith completely separate from other people. And that's where they find the greatest depth of faith. Mm. You mentioned your faith as being important to you. Were you raised religious or did you seek it out? I'm going to answer that both. I was raised raised religious. I'm, I'm still in the same faith as my as my parents. And actually, they're, my, my, my grandparents were in that faith. So there's a tradition associated with that. And so it was introduced to me since I was young. Um, but there comes a time when uh, what mommy and daddy said, that, that really can't define who I'm going to be and what's important because I certainly would not have been able to deal with some of the struggles I've had in my life if I was wholly relying on external people. And um, so, yeah, I've had to go seek out what is, what is truth to me and what is my faith and what is, how is that going to define who I am and what I'm going to act like in my life? Mm -hmm. um, so the answer is both in those, but certainly, um, you know, if it hadn't been introduced to me the way that it was when I was young, my, my journey would have been different for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Makes sense. Yeah. We're going to go through a few more questions and then we're going to close off the panel. And so does blending resemble group think too much? Is there room for some level of blending? Um, define blending for me. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with the term. Uh, so kind of fitting in with everyone else. Okay. So generically, I wasn't sure if there was a psychological term that I was missing. Maybe. Um, but it doesn't matter because probably they weren't talking about that. <laughs> um, I don't think, I, I define groupthink and blending differently. Uh, the, okay. I think those are two different things. Okay. Um, there's one thing to be like-minded. There's another thing to fit in. And blending to fit in is about making everyone comfortable that's there and allowing yourself um, to, to be part of a group that actually might think differently than you. Um, and sometimes it even means not even sharing your own thoughts. And that's like the antithesis, right, of groupthink. So um, I, I think those things are different. However, I think blending allows or facilitates or catalyzes groupthink very, very well. Um, if you can put yourself in a position where you don't immediately um, define yourself as different than everybody else, then it allows you to introduce different ideas, right? And, and variation um, more easily, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we, we can't, as, as humans, we, we're wired. Things that are different, look different than us, feel different than us, smell different than us, all those things, there is going to be always a, some kind of anxiety around that until we learn more about it. So if we can buffer that with blending, right, then I think it, it facilitates better group think. But I do think, see those as being two different things. Yeah. You're the master at creating psychologically safe environments for people where they can really shine. <laughs> well, I, I try to. Sometimes I misread. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. It's not like I, I, I'm, uh, I'm batting 100 or anything. Mm, makes sense. And so do you find it easy to remember people you meet infrequently or do you find, forget those kinds of interactions? Mm, I forget names a lot. So I, I try to find tools for that. Um, I never forget a face um, that I've seen and I generally don't forget the feeling that I had when I was with them. Um, so even, even if it was you know, I have lots of acquaintances in my life. When when I, when you I work with a sales team and I'm visiting customers and and stuff, um, and I or I go to events and there's literally hundreds of people there that I might be interacting with. Um, so I, I don't forget those people, no, and I don't forget the dynamic that they create and the way that they make me feel, because ultimately that's what determines my relationship with them. Um, so no, I don't forget those things, but don't ask me their name afterward. I, in fact, I, I, one of the things that I have to, to teach myself is if I can say their name three times at least in the conversation before I leave them, then there's a 90% chance I'll remember their name the next time I see them. If I don't, there's no way. And so I've just got, actually, I've gotten very comfortable with simply asking, I know we've met before, we talked at 
you know, this a place, remind me again what your name is. Or I ask somebody else who is a thinker and remembers those things really, really well, what's their name again? And um, so I, I always like to have a wingman that can help me with that kind of stuff. That's great. Um, and so thank you, Jonathan, for coming out. You are both Mr. Nice Guy and you are also Mr. Charismatic and Mr. Good Husband and Mr. Uh, great Speaker <laughs> and Mr. Good Cooker. So you have a lot of really great things that you provide to other people and you provide so much service to people. You're always out there serving people and that really shows character. So you have really strong character and you focus so much on other people that it sometimes comes to the ne neglect of your own self and a superhero, like it's kind of like superheroic because you're always meeting other people's needs. And then the last one to get their needs met is, is you, unless you make a conscious effort to change that. And that is really nice because it shows people that altruism does exist. And so thank you for being the reminder that altruism is a thing. And thank you audience members for asking such great questions. And I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joyce. Bye. <laughs>